One of the most interesting, personally to me, and as yet poorly explored, uh, phenomena that we treat, especially in New Code, is this imposition, linguistic imposition on the flow of experience that we call conscious and unconscious. It's important to begin with to understand no such things exist. It is, however, extremely useful to impose such linguistic constructs on the flow of experience in order to get a certain amount of leverage, the ability to move things around and to make things happen. It's important that we don't believe in the impositions we actually make. However, it's ex equally important that we know how to make use of the leverage provided by such an imposed distinction. Uh, until I finish this uh, sentence, uh, the watcher listener will be unaware of the location and present uh, temperature of their left big toe. As soon as you hear the language form, your consciousness shifts, your awareness moves to that part of your body, and suddenly what was previously, a second ago, unconscious becomes available, conscious. So, even in this imposed uh, reality, this se segmentation, this punctuation of experience, um, it's clear that even inside of this box, the distinction between these two imposed entities, conscious and unconscious, is a d dynamic one. That is, what was in the unconscious a moment ago can quickly be, become available at the conscious level, and things that we were focusing on consciously can also now drop into the unconscious functioning, leaving us free to search for uh, new things, uh, things of interest, which will then capture our attention. This is the natural flow of experience. Now the application, uh, Gregory Bateson, uh, one of my most uh, honored mentors and someone who I uh, deeply am indebted to, uh, used to talk about the conscious and the unconscious as containing two separate and quite distinct logics. Um, if this is so, and I happen to find this a useful way of thinking about this, uh, it becomes clear that you will never, quote, integrate conscious and unconscious. These are two different logical types, and the attempt to integrate these will ultimately fail each and every time. So the question is not integration, the question becomes coordination. Bateson used to pose the problem in the following terms. He would say, look, if the logic of the unconscious and the logic of the conscious are incommensurable, a very precise term, which means cannot be mapped isomorphically from one to the other, uh, then the task is one of coordination. And it is not from the unconscious that creativity uh, comes. It is from the collision of these two incommensurable logics that the spark which we call creativity comes from. I find this in a very attractive way to think about how to organize. In that sense, in every single workshop, Every piece of work that I've publicly done, certainly in the last 10 to 15 years with Carmen Bostic St. Clair, it is a unspecified, implicit objective of everything that we do to find ways of coordinating these two great entities which compose what we are. This suggests uh, what we now have called in NLP signal systems. And there are various different kinds of signals. The unconscious, in most cases, there are some interesting exceptions, does not have a voice. Internal dialogue, the ability to generate language, while it rests 95% on an unconscious process, is very strongly under the influence of conscious desire, of conscious objectives, of, of conscious uh, movements toward things that people wish to, to achieve. So that the ideal signal system with the unconscious is one which is verified to be involuntary. The importance of this is uh, extreme. It is a waste of time, in my opinion, to pretend to have signals with the unconscious unless those signals are somehow verified to be involuntary outside the influence of conscious process. Otherwise, you're talking to another part of your conscious mind, or the ambiguity is complete and you don't know whether this, where the signals are coming from, another conscious part or some part of the unconscious. So there are various types of these signals because of presuppositions culturally that exist in Western European cultures and Western European derivative cultures. Feelings or so-called emotions are usually placed in a privileged category called involuntary. 
If you ask people who uh, participate in religious rituals, organize religions, what they go to church for, the answer will inv inevitably be whatever the content of the answer is. The form of the answer will be feelings. There are certain feelings which they can achieve by these religious practices which are not normally available to them outside of that context and outside of that practice. I propose because of contrasting cultures such as no uh, Native Americans in North America uh, that it is uh, there are other groups of people for whom the images which we play with on a daily basis as a normal part of our everyday experience are involuntary. The sun dance among some of the Southwest Plains Indian tribes is an example of an excruciating ordeal which involves severe amounts of pain kinesthetically which when overcome lead to a breakthrough and suddenly the vision quest is satisfied. An image of the purpose and the intention behind a person's life now becomes manifest to them through this ordeal. This is the extreme to which they go in order to achieve a certain kind of visualization. Something, visualization, which occurs on a daily, moment-to-moment -moment basis for most Western European derivative people. So these are culturally relative statements. However, in every group, and I think the basis of this is the limitations of consciousness, the seven plus or minus two chunks of attention which we have available, and where we put such attention. Um, given three major representational systems, which all cultures seem to utilize, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, in Western European derivative cultures, there is a preference for making the kinesthetics involuntary. Therefore, in work in such a context, I bias, as does Carmen, what we do towards the development of signals which are based in physiological symptoms, body sensations, which allow the person to know yes or no what the opinion and support or lack of uh, support of the unconscious is given a particular proposal or a particular plan. Um, the most interesting and important class of such signals are what we can now call SOS, capitalizing on an international code, old Morse code, uh, a, uh, a uh, request for assistance. Uh, now an SOS is a spontaneously occurring signal. That is, you're going about your day, you're a manager in a company, at home with uh, uh, some of the family members, out in the street uh, doing commerce, and suddenly a strong sensation comes over you. Sometimes it's global, the entire body team seems to participate, and sometimes it's quite precisely localized. What is this? Well, the answer is, it's an invitation to a dance. The unconscious is generating a sensation to warn you, to bring your attention to something, to somehow initiate a contact between itself, the unconscious processes, which run your metabolism, your balance, and all the important things in your life, and this little thing that sits on top called consciousness, which decides where we're going to go with the support of the unconscious. Such SOS experiences, when taken advantage of, lead to a deeper and deeper rapport between conscious and unconscious. It's quite simple once you recognize the intention behind the sensation to discover a way of proposing a manipulation by the unconscious of the sensations which are otherwise involuntary for you, that is, cannot be changed by your conscious uh, processes, in order to designate a certain kind of sensation as yes and another kind of sensation as no. And this is quite easily done once there's a recognition of the intention, the positive intention behind the sensation, rather than taking a pill to get rid of it or finding some way of ignoring it or pushing on through, uh, which is the typical uh, Western European response to such uh, annoyances. Uh, obviously, uh, in order to make a, a certain kind of re reciprocity, even symmetry between conscious and unconscious, it's important that the conscious mind have specific ways of initiating contact with the unconscious. The SOS that I've just finished discussing, discussing is initiated by the unconscious and responded to by the conscious. The inverse, of course, is an important part of the choices that we need. The entire point of such coordination is to achieve, typically temporarily, states of grace, states of congruency, in which there's an alignment between the movement at the unconscious level and at the conscious level. When such congruency, such states of grace occur, 
this is what we call charisma. This is what we call presence. This is what we call people who know what the hell they're doing and are precise about where they're going. These are the people who inspire us. These are the people who lead us. And each of us are capable of such states. And the key to accessing such states of congruency, or states of grace, if you will, is the ability to coordinate between these two great entities inside of each of us, the conscious and the unconscious, in order to achieve what we call congruency.